Hello, hello. We are live and it's just occurring to me that I forgot to clean up the shower. John just said, do you not feel like this is violating our privacy? I'm like, um, have you ever known me to be a private person? <laughs> There's the real world, y'all. We shower with a lot of products. Um, fun fact, those hooks. Okay, we redid this bathroom. Actually, I was in NP school, so seven, eight years ago, and we had like, we had some damage. And so we had to gut the whole thing. And um, I absolutely love our bathroom, love the tile and whatnot. But when we, my husband wanted these hooks installed in the shower so that we could hang our towels there and just have them ready. I was concerned. I was like, we're going to drill a hole in the tile and it's going to get wet. It's going to be a major problem. Um, sorry, hang on one second. Forgot to silence my phone. Yet again, I'm just on here to let you guys know, uh, to reassure you, the amateur hour effect. And my microphone is sitting over there. Could y'all hear any of that? <laughs> the playback of this is going to be so fun to watch. Um, are we plugged in? Yes, we're plugged in. Okay, can you hear me now? I don't know if you could hear me before. Um, I need to silence my phone because, because, so, um, all right, all set. Anyways, um, yeah, so that has been a great thing because you don't have to open the shower door and you can stay warm. You can keep all that warmth around you and not have to open the door into the cold, cruel world before you put your towel on. It's going to be great. Okay, y'all, um, synapses are starting to fire. I'm starting to wake up. So this, if you are just jumping in on this for the first time, this is a weekly live that I do while I'm getting ready for work, um, putting on some makeup because one sweet friend asked me to do a makeup tutorial and uh, she's validated my whole existence. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's just talk while I get ready and maybe I'll throw in a little makeup tidbits here and there. Um, although I think at this point I've done three or four lives. Y'all know I don't have any more. There, I'm out of them. But anyways, um, I struggle with multitasking, so just bear with me here. Bear with me. I'm looking for moisturizer because I have rosacea. My skin is super, super dry, and we have to start with moisturization. I don't know where the heck I put my lotion. In the process of cleaning up, I put things where I don't know. There it is. It's hiding behind the computer. That's where it is. Um, so anyway, so these lives are an opportunity for us to just chat. If you're jumping on here, please don't hesitate to um, ask a question if you want to know anything. I'm an open book. As my husband says, are you sure you want to put it all out there? Yep, I'll just put it all out there. I've always been that way. I can't keep secrets. I'm an open book. Um, so I'm starting with some Clinique. The original, like, oh my God, my mom used this moisturizer 40 years ago. It's been around forever, but it, it works. Okay, so in these lives, I do have a category picked out so that I can monologue if there's nobody that has anything they want to ask. So there's a topic, and this week is liver failure. Um, and I chose liver failure because that is the blog post that I wrote this week. And I had chosen that topic before I decided that I wanted everything to be cohesive across all my platforms. So whatever topic I'm talking about on my blog, I'm gonna talk about on TikTok, and I'm gonna talk about here. And I, I'm not sure I fully thought through this because liver failure is probably the most complicated thing in the world. And talking about on a live without the ability to edit anything out, it's a little scary. It's a little scary, it's a little intimidating, especially on three hours of sleep after post-call after night shift. <laughs> Talk about intimidating. But having said that, I love to talk about liver failure. It is probably one of my most favorite topics because I think it is one of the most underestimated and underappreciated organs of the whole body. Everybody always talks about the heart, right? Card everybody loves cardiology, how complex it is, all the ways that it can fail, all the different things you can do to keep it going. Everybody loves cardiology. And, you know, pumping hearts keep us alive. But I argue the liver is even more multifaceted and can fail in even more ways than the heart can. And it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me. In part because as a bedside nurse, I don't think I've fully linked together a lot of the complications and sequela that occur in an acute decompensation of chronic 
liver failure. I don't think I linked them. I just went in the room and saw this patient with all these problems and felt very overwhelmed. And once you kind of broil it back down to what's going on with the liver, broil, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right adjective, verb. See how the synapses are just firing? <laughs> um, anyways, it just, it just makes sense. I love those aha moments. And, and I was very blessed, very, very blessed to do a thorough rotation with the liver transplant team at Emory because that's where I went to school. And Emory, as far as I know, has the only um, liver or hepatology focused ICU in the state that I'm aware of. Um, they, are, they do a phenomenal job caring for acute liver failure as well as acute on chronic liver failure and chronic liver failure because they transplant to people. Um, it's, it's really, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. If there's anybody on here that's watching this or knows people from that team, um, that unit is amazing. Um, both the ICU and the transplant unit, which are separate. The ICU uh, does Mars liver dialysis. Most people don't know that that's a thing. I didn't know it was a thing either. It's so fascinating to me. You can wash the body um, with albumin and rid the body of those albumin related um, albumin bound toxins like ammonia. So it's really, really fascinating. Sometimes you walk by the room, a patient would be on Mars, they'd be on CRRT, they'd have um, cardiac support, a million drips. Like those are the sickest patients I've ever seen in my life, hands down. So the liver, oh, the liver and the ways that it can fail. I'm going to have to refer to my notes as we go along because close call. Um, okay, so I put on my lotion and I put on my favorite primer, which is Bobbi Brown face base. It's great. It smells a little bit like citrus, like oranges. It's so nice. And it just like helps for us dry girls. Moisturize, get it ready for the makeup. Um, okay, so liver failure. It started making a lot more sense to me once I broke it down into understanding chronicity, severity. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Welcome to my humble abode in the mess today. Um, hopefully I set this up so y'all can see, I think I did set this up so y'all can see the live chats, but Mr. Midwife is here, Chad. Great, great, great guy. Um, love those midwives. Um, okay, so you break it down into chronicity, severity, and sequela. And I think it helps to kind of understand it a little better. Now, so chronic liver failure, talk about that first, because that's the one that most people are living with. It's been there for greater than 26 weeks by definition. These patients are typically stable. They're managed outpatient. They have a lot, just like heart failure, right? It's compared to that, right? You have a heart failure outpatient and doing great. Um, they're managed pretty well. I mean, you can't reverse it, right? It is what it is. The liver has failed, but you can manage the fallout of the problems by, you know, heart failure, measure weight, you give diuretics, similar kind of thing in chronic liver failure. So these people are going along, they have a lot of complications, a lot of problems from the failing liver, and it gets worse over time. And eventually something happens that tips them over the scale. And it's usually either a GI bleed or sepsis, um, which is like a secondary insult to the liver or a primary insult to the liver. Like the end stage liver failure is just getting more end stage. It's just getting worse or they stop taking their lactulose. They stop taking their meds um, or they continue to drink alcohol, which is probably the most common cause. So they end up in your ICU and they're in massive shock and they're sick as snot, sick, 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 sick people. This is the majority of what we treat is acute on chronic liver failure. There's another subset, which is 100% different, and that is the acute liver failure patient. So that is a patient who is healthy, healthy liver, no, he no hepatitis, no cirrhosis, and there is um, an acute injury to the liver. And the two most common things we see are Tylenol overdose and shock liver. So the patient who had poor perfusion, this is what I commonly, commonly see, um, they get ischemic hepatitis is the name for it, or shock liver, um, elevated transaminitis, um, acute onset liver failure, all of these kind of things are ways to classify it or describe it. And these patients are very interesting. Now with shock liver, set that aside for a minute. Let's just talk about like the Tylenol overdose or hepatotoxins, something, some big insult has occurred to the liver um, and the liver goes from fine to 
basically not functioning at all in a very short period of time. These people are not used to that versus your chronic patient whose liver had got large and then it got really small and fibrotic. And there's a whole bunch of problems we'll talk about in a minute that come from that, that those patients slowly adapt over time. Acute liver patients are not like that, right? They're not used to it. There's no swelling or fibrosis of the liver. So there's no problems with squishing on the portal vein. And that portal vein compression is what causes nine tenths of what happens in decompensated chronic liver failure. So we don't have that. But what we do have is a failing liver. So you have a failure to produce clotting factors. You have um, difficulty regulating your, your blood sugar levels. You have um, uh, the big thing is the ammonia level. So the hepatocytes fail and they cannot conjugate bilirubin and get rid of ammonia. So they cannot conjugate ammonia to bilirubin. So ammonia builds up and builds up and builds up. And ammonia is what causes hepatic encephalopathy, that confusion, stupor, asterisks leading to coma. And if it's bad, it causes cerebral edema and the brain can't handle that. So these are effectively like traumatic brain injury patients. These are people who have high ICPs. So they're more like neuro patients than liver patients. Super weird, right? Super, super weird and complicated. Um, so fascinating to me. But that's your main issue is dealing with the ammonia. You've got to clear that ammonia and you've got to clear it fast. So depending on when they took the Tylenol, you're going to give them NAC. Um, in acetylcysteine. Well, uh, sorry, let me back up. You can give them charcoal if it's within four hours to bind it. Then you give them NAC. Um, did I write down the timing on that? I want to, I want to say it's anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. You can still give them NAC. Um, and that will help get rid of some of the ammonia. Um, you also, where did I my killer at? Oh my God. Lactulose is a little too slow. You need something fast. Um, dialysis, renal dialysis can clear high ammonia levels too, but it's also slow. Liver dialysis. These are the ones you really want to consider moving to a transplant center or a, um, exactly. Tylenol is in everything. And when people take Norco's, even if they take 15 of them, you know, uh, I would, so recommendations are less than four grams of Tylenol in a day. I think it may even shift it down to three grams. But when you look at like toxic levels, and I read a lot of research articles on this, but um, you're talking like levels in excess of like 10, 12 grams, per day. but it varies because all of us have different um, capacity to handle how much Tylenol and the effects of it. So it's like all over the map as far as how severe it is based on how much they took. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, Tylenol is in all the things. Um, Liver dialysis. So these are the people that you want to consider getting to a transplant center who has Mars um, and probably pretty quickly. Um, so these are the ones that I'll call on real quickly. So you really want to assess how bad the hepatic encephalopathy is. And you do that based on something called King's criteria. You look at asterixis. You look at how severe the confusion is on a scale of like just mild confusion to coma. Um, what else is in there? Age, I think. No, no, no. Age and lactate levels are things that make it, um, that um, increase the severity of it, but not that go into that specific uh, thing. So, um, so anyway, so that's acute. So totally different kind of patient. Sometimes those people, you want to allow permissive hypertension, hypernatremia. So you may put them on hypertonic saline, um, dry brain cells shrink. And you want to prevent the fallout of the ICPs rising too high. You also want to have their maps pretty augmented to coral to compensate for um, uh, for the high ICPs. So you want to get cerebral perfusion pressure. So if you think if your ICPs are approaching that 20 range, you want your map well over that to get CPP. So you need a map closer to like 70 or 80 to drive pressure to the brain. You need blood flow. Um, I didn't write anything else down on them. So that's acute. Okay. That's not a lot of people. Now ischemic hepatitis patients. Okay. Ischemic hepatitis patients, which is the most common cause of like acute liver failure that we see in the ICU because everybody has a little bit of shock liver. Like everybody, everybody in the ICU has a little bit of shock liver. Ultimately these people are, they, they tolerate it really, really well. It's not bad, 
like the numbers may go up super high, but come down real quickly. They don't usually generate an ammonia bolus from it. Um, and there's just not a lot to do about it. The, the, the thing is to treat the underlying cause and to, um, uh, you know, increase perfusion to the liver and it'll, it'll turn around on its own. So it's rare that that really turns into much of anything, but you see that a lot, lot, lot in practice. Um, so that's sort of a form of acute liver failure. Experience. And what you will also see in reality is pe everybody has some, well, not everybody, a lot of people have some degree of some type of stable chronic liver disease. And then you throw in an acute ischemic hepatitis event on top of it. And it's sort of like, what is it? Is, is it acute on chronic or is it acute? It's really kind of more acute if they don't have the sequela of the decompensated um, liver failure. Okay, so that's acute um, and that's chronic. The bulk of what we're gonna talk about is acute on chronic liver failure. Mm. They're so fun, y'all. They're sick as not. <laughs> They're sick as not. Okay, so acute on chronic liver failure. I have to remember to multitasking is hard. It's hard, y'all. Um, and here's an ADD random tangent for you. Do you guys know this stuff? Barley's omega-3 fish oil. This stuff will change your life. My friend told me about this, and it's the only way I can now take fish oil because it doesn't taste, it doesn't leave that weird taste in your mouth, and you don't have to remember to take a pill every day. So I leave it over here at night, and I just take a swig. I don't even know how much I take. I just take a swig every night. It's amazing. It tastes good. It's like creamy and sweet. It has no fish taste to it whatsoever. It's amazing. Go get it. Maybe I'll put a link in the description below if I can remember to do that, remember to do that kind of stuff. But if I do, I'll put an Amazon link before. I think I got it on Amazon. So yeah, I'll stick an Amazon link down there. Okay. A little bit of makeup and then we'll progress. Y'all rosacea is so bad today. It's so bad. I don't know why. I haven't been more stressed than usual. Tell me why. Tell me why. I'm going to see a new dermatologist um, in the beginning of February. I'm super excited about that because vanity. Um, okay. So acute on chronic liver failure. So anything that creates a state of chronic liver failure has can and will at some point in time decompensate. Now things that are, you know, the most common things that we see for chronic liver failure is alcohol. Um, not fishy at all. Not at all. I mean, it has, Mona said, is it fishy? No, none, none whatsoever. It is just, it's almost a little sweet. Um, let me see if I can, um, I don't know if I can show you. I don't know if this is going to go over well. Uh, let me just chug it for you. Let me just chug it for you. You can see my reaction. It's not bad. <laughs> right, let me just chug it for you. Let me just chug it for you. You can see my reaction. It's not bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see that color? This is mango. They have a bunch of different flavors. It's so good. It's, I don't, I'm not describing this very well, but it's, it's just, trust me. It's great. It's great. And then you have to remember to take that stupid pill. I used to put the pills in the freezer so that you didn't have that fishy burpy thing, but then I never took it because I, I can't remember anything. Um, hello. I don't know how to say your name. Bewey, Bewey, Bewit, Wheat, Butt. It's not, but <laughs> hi, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining the monologue. Throw it in any questions right now. We're talking about acute on chronic liver failure, which I love the TikTok I did on this, I think was titled why the liver gets no love. <laughs> I love stupid stuff like that. Why the liver gets no love redhead stepchild of the ICU. Okay. So anything that will cause chronic liver failure can and will fail and common things in America is, um, alcohol. We love our alcohol. Um, autoimmune hepatitis, I think is number two. Hold on. Let me, let me refer to my notes. I don't tell y'all wrong. Okay. You're going to listen, listen, people. Sometimes I say smart things and sometimes I don't. So please uh, fact check me on all of this, but I did in, in writing this <coughs> blog post, I'm also writing a second book. I probably researched for, well, not weeks, but a week, maybe. Uh, I have tons and tons and tons of research articles. And I'd like that I have the background in liver failure. So I'm not talking out of my head, but it's complicated stuff. So just fact check me. Never, ever, ever. This is how I feel about people on the internet, right? People on the interwebs can say whatever they want to say and come across as smart and they may not be. So always vet your resources <coughs> and fact check. Um, 
Okay. Makeup always looks terrible on the days I do this. <laughs> Just so you know, 3 a.m. at the hospital, the people I work with, it's not a good day for makeup because I'm distracted. I don't do well with distraction, but y'all are important to me. I'm committed. Um, but talk about educating on complicated stuff and entertaining and putting on makeup. Holy crap. Is that, does that make me a triple threat? Just validate me and tell me it does. <laughs> this is all an exercise in vain. Okay. Um, I gotta do some bronzer. Um, okay. Yeah, we were talking about causes. So where are we down at? Honestly, I wrote notes and they're not on here. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Hold on. Let me refer to exactly. Exactly. You you, you can you have to I'm thinking if I want to share this or not. Okay. People who seem really, really smart on the internet, maybe in person that aren't quite the same. Um, it's validated for me that uh, people could convince you of anything on here. So yeah, I agree. As long as you're just like transparent and you urge other people to do their own research and your goal is to help. If there's a little bit of error in there, it is what it is. TikTok taught me this. TikTok taught me this. We're not for everybody. Creators are not for everybody. They are going to, and that includes doctors who may or may not be smarter than you that like to treat you like you're not smart and or people who point out the one wrong thing you said in a three minute TikTok. It is what it is. Okay. In general, education with a, okay, hold on one second with me. Bear with me. I want to pull up the blog post I wrote because it's better. It's better organized. I can sort it out here. Hold please. Okay. Yes. Where did I write down the etiology? Sorry, guys. Why won't it open? Probably because I have 15 tabs open and my kids is they say this is a marker of how old you are is how many tabs you have open. But here's my argument for this. Um, what if I, it's a little bit like hoarding? What if I want to get back to that tab like in 30 minutes or five days from now and I can't find it. So I just leave it open. <laughs> That's probably why things move so slow. Everything has consequences in life. Um, okay. Yes, here we go. Acute liver failure can lead to chronic failure. ETOH, autoimmune hepatitis, hep B, hep C. NASH, I forgot to talk about NASH cirrhosis. I see this in practice a lot more than what the paperwork tells you the prevalence is, a lot. I don't know if that's just because of our diet, probably our diet, our diet. Wilson's disease, which is weird, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing, cholangitis, PBC and PSC are ductal diseases that I've only only ever seen at Emory, but they are, they are interesting people. Um, Okay. Uh, all right. So anyways, one of those things creates chronic liver failure. Then there's repeated insult to the liver from alcohol use or not medication non-compliance or worsening of the chronic liver disease because it just <coughs> progresses. That's what it does. It gets to end stage at some point in time. Um, or something tips them over the scales like um, sepsis or GI bleed, which are the very, very common things. And um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is the thing that I see in reality. That is the big thing. Um, okay, let me do this real quick. Kitten, the bronzer high on the cheekbones. Miss Ashley, are you here today? <laughs> is there any other middle-aged ladies here? I think I say this on all the videos. This is like one of the best tips I ever got. Was, Put the bronzer high on the cheekbones, not below it, because everything sags as we age. So just raise it up. I love it. I love it. Fake them all out. Um, okay. Let me just blend that. Because last time I did this, I didn't blend so well. And watching the playback, I was like, oh, guys, why did y'all not call me out on that? It looked pretty bad. Um, and then a little highlighter or blush. And we're good to go. Oh, no, we're not. I lied. Psych. 
like. Um, so the thing with liver failure, I will never forget um, the attending physician, the director of the program at Emory walked me around the unit and said, ah, very introspective guy, <coughs> super, super smart. I said, Brianna, just remember, the main problem with chronic decompensated liver failure is chronic and widespread vasodilation, vasoplegia at baseline. So these people are exquisitely sensitive to septic shock, which is right. That's right. They act like septic patients walking around the world. So then, hello, Satya, Satya, hello. Um, so they walk around like already in a place of sepsis, basically, like their vessels are profoundly leaky from the portal hypertension. And so you throw in septic shock, which is a leaky vessel problem. It's a pipe problem. And you've like way augmented that problem and they have no blood pressure. I mean, they just bottom out. So it starts from a place of portal hypertension. So we have to talk about portal hypertension. Um, portal hypertension, when the liver is either enlarged from hepatitis or cirrhotic and squished down, the main vein that runs through the liver is squished, like really, 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 really um, stenosed or impeded or obstructed. So there's no forward flow. 80% of the of the blood flow in the body goes through the liver. <laughs> so 80% of the volume in our body is trying to pass through this one vein and it can't get through. So what does it do? It backflows. Just like everything else in our bodies that have pipe problems, everything, the crap flows downstream and it's all behind the liver. So that's why you develop ascites. Ascites can translocate across the diaphragm and become pleural effusions or hepatic hydrothorax hydrothoraces, hydrothoraxes, pleural effusions from, and then you, you can get like pedal edema as like pitting edema, like you see in heart failure, where either the feet, if they're sitting upright or the back has pitting edema, that's more consistent with heart failure kind of edema. Ascites with a big distended belly and a fluid wave, um, prominent veins, spider um, hemangiomas, all those kind of things you might see, that's more ascites. So fluid back up, okay? The fluid all backs up from the portal hypertension. With the fluid backing up, you have activation of the RAS system, the renin-angiotensin, aldosterone-angiotensin system. Remember all that from school? So that's activated. So then you have an even further aggravation of fluid retention and sodium retention, but more fluid than sodium, which dilutes the sodium. So you get hyponatremia. <laughs> so all, and there's more, there's more, there's more, all because of portal hypertension. All of these factors are happening. Um, what else because of the portal hypertension? Um, so the ascites is the big, big thing. So when somebody's coming in for Decompensated liver failure, one of the common thing, main things that I'm looking for to diagnosis is going to be ascites with or without SBP. Um, and um, esophageal varices. So the other area that um, balloons out with volume is going to be the um, vessels in the esophagus and within the stomach. You can get gastric varices as well. So those all balloon out really, really big. And at some point in time, they can just rupture. And they and those people bleed like stuck pigs. It's pretty dramatic. Um, so those people chronically stable at home or on some type of beta blocker like a nadalol to prevent that from ballooning out so much and rupturing. But um, ruptured varices and ascites, probably number one and number two complications that you can help use to diagnose decompensated um, liver failure. Also hepatic encephalopathy, the ammonia level is going to rise because that same pathway we talked about in acute liver failure happens here as well. Um, they're going to be jaundiced because <coughs> bilirubin is building up. <coughs> the main thing with there's not really much you can do about this, right? The liver's failing, the bilirubin is going to rise. The only thing is in these people, if they have a lot of jaundice or the bilirubin is super high, I like to get at least one right upper quadrant ultrasound with pedal Doppler flows. 
Okay. What that's looking for is patency of the ducts um, coming out of the liver and the gallbladder. Because if you have a ductal problem and you can get duct problems, that is an acute problem which will worsen the portal hypertension. And that might be something you can do something about. So things that will cause that commonly are portal venous thrombosis. You can get clots in the portal veins because nothing's moving forward. Things are stagnant. So they can often get clots and you can heparinize. Well, this gets complicated, right? Because these people also have clotting factor problems. They have no platelets. They're often bleeding. You can discuss the possibility of thinning their blood. Um, but that's something you could possibly do something about. Um, the other thing that can cause that is, uh, Porto. Oh crap. Hold on. This is where my smart, my smart synapses aren't firing. Um, where I put it, I put it in here. Hold on. There's one other thing that'll do it. Um, Uh, I just don't know where I put it at them. The hubris of thinking I could talk about liver failure post call the hubris. Um, I work with a, another APP. His name is Paul. I don't know what that was. Um, and we work nights together and he is a real character. He is funny. We just laugh and laugh and laugh, but <laughs> One night we were talking about something. I don't know what it was. We were talking about somebody, I think. And I said, um, oh, oh, they lack hubris. And he was like, he turned to look at me and he said, do they lack it or do they have too much of it? And I was like, no, super duper arrogant. He was like, yeah. So that doesn't mean they lack hubris. <laughs> Y'all have been saying it wrong my whole damn life. <laughs> it was an aha moment. I was like, okay, all right. Let's work on our vocabulary, Brianna. Okay, we're just gonna have to call this a wash because I don't know where I put it at. I'll find it later. But there is one other thing that can cause <sighs> Bud Chiari syndrome. That's it, that's it. That's where you get kind of um, diffuse um, obstruction and narrowing of the portal veins. And that can also worsen portal hypertension. I don't know what you can do about it. I don't, I don't think you can do anything about it but it'll help you kind of bring awareness to what's causing this complication of worsening the portal hypertension. Um, so, okay, so that's some portal hypertension stuff. Other portal hypertension problems, um, we talked about ascites, we talked about varices. Uh, we talked a little bit about hepatic hydrothorax in the acute section, but these people get recurrent pleural effusions. They are just there. They have ascites, they track up into the, the um, plural space all the time. Um, and this is something that I do see in practice sometimes is that people will try and put a chest tube in this. Don't do that. There's something in my face. Sorry, it's a hair. It's a hair. Um, don't do that because it's just going to continue to drain. If the ascites isn't addressed or fixed, the fluid is just going to keep on tracking up. So you're basically just creating a conduit for fluid to just... Whew, whew, just constantly flow. Like, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, the treatment for it is to treat the ascites to either do a para or to diuresis. Um, chronic, like chronic stable patients like this are on aldactone, probably some Lasix. Um, and, and periodically they'll get paracentesis, paracentesi, parasin, you know what I'm talking about. They get those. Um, but in our world, when they come to ICU, um, when they're in shock, you can't really take volume off. You, it's a, it's a real, real complicated. These patients are probably the most complicated volume patients in the world. So you got to do a really, really good assessment of what their volume status is. Um, because if you take, you know, even small volume paracentesis off, they will drop their pressure like nothing. So make sure you're giving them albumin. All right, I got to pause for a second because if I don't. We're like 30 minutes into this and I haven't done any makeup. Okay. I'm not going to be ready for work. Um, let, let me decide what colors here super quick. Um, you know, I'm thinking it should be a pink night. What do y'all think? Pink? Pink? Hmm. I feel like I need to blend the... Did nobody tell me? 
I need to be a little more blended out. Um, us pale white girls got to blend really, really well. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think browns and pinks sound good. That's what I'm thinking. That's my thought process. Good brushes are the secret to eyeshadow. Good brushes and super pigmented product. I love Makeup Geek. I mean, I, they don't endorse me. I'm pretty sure they're out of business anyway. So clearly I am not a paid advertiser here. Um, I just like to share products that I like, aka Barlands, because everybody needs their fish oil. They keep their cholesterol at bay, amongst other things. Okay, I think it's enough. Um, color choices. So many options. So many options. So little time. Okay, I'm going to go with my kind of basic. So this is my Makeup Geek Cream Brulee. Cream Brulee. It's going to be my light color for today. Um, all right, so we were talking about more things that cause portal hyper or more effects of portal hypertension. Um, um, there's so many, there's so many ascites, esophageal varices. We talked about pleural effusions, the widespread vasodilation. Um, so with the vasodilation, these people are typically on midodrine chronically. Um, when they're in the unit and you throw some sepsis in there, these are the people that you, first of all, they're, they're walking around with a map of 65 and they're used to it. So they don't, you don't have to shoot for these super high maps unless you have a cerebral perfusion issue or something else, uh, worse than kidney failure, something where you need to augment them back to the typical, um, yes, I can talk about Mars, um, the typical 65, I usually shoot for 60, um, but, but, but if there's even a whiff of sepsis, like even a whiff, these are the people I immediately put on pressers. I'm not trying to give them, you know, aliquots of fluid and see how they respond. No, just put them on pressers early, early. And generally speaking, unless they get bad, bad, they only need a modicum of, of leave a fed for a while, but they may need it for a while. So Mr. Midwife asked, how can you explain how liver dialysis works versus renal dialysis? So it's almost the exact same thing. Same setup. You're going to need a VASCAP. Um, the machines, it's been like seven or eight years since I saw one. They're huge, just like the CRRT machines. They remove, it's extracorporeal. So it takes blood out of the body. It uses um, albumin to um, diffuse. It uses albumin to create diffusion to pull the albumin bound toxins out of the blood, which is primarily um, ammonia, but there are other things. There are like bile salts. There are, uh, there are a few other toxins that can develop because the liver is not functioning and leading to um, hepatic encephalopathy. So it bathes it just like in dialysis, you in CRRT, well, in any kind of dialysis, you have a dialysate that causes diffusion, it pulls blood out, like rinses it and then puts it back in the body. So that's what um, MARS is. It stands for, <laughs> it stands for molecular, molecular, mm, <laughs> molecular activating, crap. Okay, hold on, hold on, I got it. Molecular absorbent, molecular absorbent recirculating system. I can never remember that. It's called Mars liver dialysis. Um, it's really, really cool. Almost always these people are also in renal failure. So they have a CRRT machine, a Mars unit. They're on pressors. They may have cardiac support. Um, they're dead and their family's in a state of drama. So these are the sickest patients I've ever seen in my whole life. They are so fun, if you like that kind of thing. Um, as an ICU nurse of, what, 15, yeah, like 15 years when I rounded that unit, I was like, oh, my God, I could never. <laughs> I was. So people who work, it used to be called, it used to be on 5E at Emory. I think it, when they built a new tower, it's across the street. Those nurses are badass, y'all. They are badass. Um, so hard to keep alive because the, the fluid shifts in liver failure is, is dramatic and their pressures can be all over the map. They're, they're wild. Um, 
Okay, so I did my light color. Let me do the mid-range color. I don't know what we should do here. I think I'm gonna go with this one. This is called Mugshot. It matches the sweatpants I'm wearing today. It is from Urban Decay Naked 3. It looks, it looks like that. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Mugshot. Maybe I'm feeling criminal like tonight. Oh, I can't do that. That's not gonna work. <laughs> it's not gonna work, friends. Not gonna work. My eyesight is going along with everything else. I started having to wear readers this year and dude, I hit 45 and it's like it all went to crap, but it went down fast. Like I've had perfect eyesight. I have issues hearing well, which my family laughs about, but my eyesight has been 20-20 my whole life. I have prided myself on that fact. And then it's like I hit 45 and I can't read um, unless whatever I'm holding is 10 yards away. And it went from like just a little bit, like I just had to hold it out a little bit to like now it's like I, ca I cannot see it. It went down fast. Um, yeah, okay. Then, all right, where were we at? We were talking about, um, we were talking about Mars and then we were talking about, oh yeah, more complications from the portal hypertension which include, um, we're talking about the shock. We talked about pedal flows. Um, hyponatremia. The hyponatremia, um, have y'all heard of a meld sodium score? It is my favorite way to get a snapshot in time picture of how bad this liver is. Because we're talking about all these different problems that occur, but putting it into like an objective presentation to a family member or even an attending when you're presenting it of how bad this is can get really wordy, right? So I kind of come back to a meld, which is just one number. That's all it is. It is one number. So it is a piece of data that you put in context with a bunch of other things to get an idea of how bad this liver really is and how sick this patient is. But what you have to remember is that number is constantly changing. It's like a blood pressure. It's like saying his blood pressure is has a stolic of 60. Okay, well, that could mean he's going to die in five minutes, or it could mean that we do something about it and turn it around. So it's just one snapshot in time. But in general, a meld sodium is the number that is, it's a, scale, a score that is generated based on INR, sodium, um, bilirubin, bilirubin, sodium, creatinine, what else was in it? One other thing. And it gets, spits out a number. Um, anything over 15 will get you listed for transplant. Well, that's the criteria that's required in order to get on a list for transplant. 40 is the top. I've actually seen numbers higher than 40. I didn't think it was possible, but it is. Um, so the high, closer you get to that 40 number, the worse it looks at that moment in time. I bring it up because it incorporates the sodium because when the sodium is dropping, gives you a really good indication of how bad the liver has gotten because you are, you've now activated that RAS system. You are hanging on to so much fluid and it is, it is a poor prognostic indicator when the sodium is very low. So um, hyponatremia, these patients, the acute on chronic patients tolerate this way better than the acute patient that we talked about earlier. So you're not as quick to add on a hypertonic because, um, Increased ICPs are not a problem for these people with hepatic encephalopathy and correcting the sodium isn't as dire because they kind of are living with a little bit more um, low sodium typically. Um, so sodium restrict, diurese. Uh, what else do we do for the sodium? That's kind of really it. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had a patient that I've given hypertonics to that has decompensated liver failure. Um, Yeah. Okay. So the notes I had written typically only treat if it's symptomatic and less than 110, but what defines symptomatic? Cause the symptoms of hyponatremia are basically everything else that you're seeing in this patient. So very hard to define. Um, and then hepatic encephalopathy is also a factor of the um, portal hypertension, um, which we've already talked about a little bit. Lactose, faximin, dialysis. We talked about that already. Um, but 
Unlike the acute patient, these patients are used to ammonia levels being high. So you don't have the high ICPs. You don't have the cerebral edema. I don't I think I've ever seen an chronic liver failure patient, but I have seen people who can't clear the ammonia. They're very, very refractory and I've had to put them on CRRT in order to clear it. Um, okay. Another complication of the portal hypertension, which is um, unique to liver failure is hepatorenal syndrome. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you've ruled out AKI from ATN, from sepsis, from hypovolemia, and it is strictly related to the liver failure and the backflow of fluids. So then you get poor perfusion to the kidney. So it is directly related to the liver failure. Um, it's hard to diagnose because nine times out of 10, these people are septic and they have an ATN. So it's like, do they have both? Or one of the, I mean, it's hard to tease out. What you do is you give these people um, a trial of albumin. If it is um, AKI, related to something, not the liver, the usual stuff that we see, the usual culprits, it will typically respond to albumin. You'll start to see an increase in urine output. You'll start to see a, a drop in the creatinine. HRS will not, no matter how much albumin you give. So that can kind of, it's not pathognomonic, but it's, it's a strong indication that you have it. These are also people that you have, a, you have a nephrologist on board too. Um, this is a bad sign. If they develop hepatorenal syndrome, it moves them up the transplant list. So if you have a patient like this, it's already on the list, call your transplant center and have them, you know, give them an update on where he's at. You might be able to move this person up. The last thing I want to say about HRS, uh, don't make this mistake because I did this one time and I'll never make it again. Don't ever offer the family dialysis um, because HRS in particular, when the liver fails and then the kidney fails, it's a late sign. And Offering a bridge to nothing is prolonging suffering and it's just not good for the patient, for the family. It's not a good use of healthcare dollars per se, um, of healthcare dollars per se. Um, they're going to set them up for more complications with no answer in sight. So most nephrologists that I've encountered never offer dialysis to patients who are in acute liver failure with renal failure, unless unless you can prove really, really well that this is caused by something acute, something like there's infection, um, like a UTI, there's infection that has led to the um, ATN and you can correct it. But in the process of correcting it, they just need a little dialysis for a bit. It's hard, hard, hard. One time I talked to a family and we were having a very difficult goals of care talk and it segued into, would they want dialysis? And I don't, I don't think I offered it to them, but I said, if it got to that point, would you want it? We went down this whole rabbit hill, rabbit hole talking about dialysis. And the nephrologist came in two thirds of the way through and he was like, mm, we can't offer that. I was like, mm. I, told him, I didn't tell him we could, but I mean, alluded to that. So it's a problem. Don't offer it. Um, hepatopulmonary syndrome. This is so cool. This is so cool. This is to me the most fascinating thing about liver failure. Okay. With that back up of volume, <clears throat> you get pulmonary vasodilation. This is the opposite of pulmonary hypertension. Think about it like that. The pulmonary blood vessels dilate. So what happens is that you get a shunt. Blood passes from the right heart to the left without ever being oxygenated because it's passing through this widely patently dilated capillary bed and okay so here's your blood flowing through here here's the interstitium here's the lung there's no diffusion that can occur because it's just like flowing fast and in the middle of this so there's no diffusion so these people will be profoundly hypoxic you diagnose this um, by getting an echo with a bubble study so you know when we do echoes with bubble for people that we worry about patent frame and ovales um, they'll do a bubble study. They take a syringe of saline and they agitate it with a lot of air and then they inject it and they, they inject it in the vein. <clears throat> they watch it pass through the cardiac cycle on the echocardiogram. And if there's a PFO there, you will see it. If it'll go, you'll see air bubbles pop up in the right heart and immediately go to the left. Like hey, there's a hole there. Not supposed to do that. <clears throat> Typically in a normal heart, you put this air in there. It goes out in the capillary bed and it just stays there, it lodges somewhere. It never comes back to the heart. But here's the thing. Here's what's cool. In pulmonary vasodilation like this, it is not going to 
pass immediately from the right heart to the left. It's going to take a few cardiac cycles. I don't know, three, four, maybe even six pumps of the heart before you're going to see that air pass through. Cause it's got to go all the way through the right heart, all the way through the pulmonary capillary beds and then back. So if your echo tech isn't familiar with doing this, which most of them aren't, you have to tell them, I want you to do a delayed bubble study and describe what that means. They'll just look for that immediate flash and then they'll move on to the next thing and they'll never see it. So it's got to be a delayed bubble study. And this is pathognomonic for hepatopulmonary syndrome. Um, fascinating stuff. And here's what's even cooler about this thing. These people, I have totally neglected doing any makeup. Um, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Um, these people, edible. That's what's going on in the outer corners. Edible and what was the other one called? Anyway, fun names tonight. Um, these people huh, are the complete opposite of every other acute hypoxemic respiratory failure patient you've ever taken care of. They're weird. They're super weird. So normally when we go in a room and someone is desatting or dyspneic, what do we do? We pull them up in the bed and we sit them up at a 90 degree angle and we help open up the lung. We use physiology to help people breathe. Well, these people hate that. You sit them up, um, you pull them up in the bed and it gets worse. You lay them flat and it gets better. <laughs> No, it, nothing else in pathophysiology does that. It, it's it's bizarre. And I've seen it in person. It is super weird. So you, you lay them flat, the sats get better, the dyspnea goes away. And you're like, what the heck? Yep. Um, I don't 100% know why. <laughs> I should know the answer to that. I don't know why. It just is. It is. Okay. Um, and I bring it up only because it helps you to make diagnoses and it helps you to make sense of things. Leave the patient flat. I guess that's what the treatment for it. Leave them flat. Quit setting them up. Um, oh, we have a tornado warning here in Georgia where I'm at. It's great. We will get tornadoes every couple of years. They're pretty bad. One passed through Atlanta a couple of years ago and tore things up. Um, so those, those phenomena I was describing are platypnea and orthodeoxia. Fancy words, impress your friends. Um, orthodeoxia is when they desaturate sitting up and improve their sats laying down. Platypnea is where they, the dyspnea resolves by laying them flat. Um, okay. Hepatocellular carcinoma. This is the last part of the complication of the, of the, um, portal hypertension that I'm going to talk about. Hepatocellular carcinoma. This is liver cancer. And this is, I, I think it, I want to say it almost always occurs in a patient who already has cirrhosis. So these patients need a, right, just a light breeze, right? Just blow my car all over the, the road because I'm such a good driver anyway. <laughs> um, I will say this. We have had horrible weather like for the whole month here in Georgia. It is nasty and overcast and rainy and floody and not typical for us, but it is phenomenal for a person who wants to sleep during the day. When I drive home at eight o'clock in the morning, it is so gross and overcast. Like, Makes my heart happy because I sleep a little better. Um, okay, so these people, uh, a lot of them develop cancer. So they need screening. They need surveillance when they're outpatient for HCC. I don't know that it really changes things in the ICU setting. It's just another piece to add to your goals of care talk, which is a big, 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 big factor in these patients in the ICU. Everything we talk about here is to help you understand what's going on with the patient, understand the severity and be able to have goals of care talks with these families. Because I feel like in my practice, I would say probably 75% of the time you talk to the patients and or the family and they're like, they knew that this was a, a terminal diagnosis. They knew that at some point it was going to get to this, but they're always just like shocked that it is like, wait, he, she's not going to live. No, no. No, she's not. But if you can get a firm grasp on how bad things are right now and be able to clearly describe that to families, it, it gives them more peace and more understanding that, okay, we've gotten to the point of no return. And it, it just, it helps. It really, really helps if you understand the disease process and can explain that to families in a way that they can understand and appreciate. Um, so I'm a big proponent of that. Um, okay, so then other complications that aren't necessarily related to the portal hypertension that are problematic for people with liver failure that I always talk about. And when I write my note, I put 
in the section of liver failure, because I think that a lot of people have a hard time remembering that this sequela of problems are directly related to the liver failure are thrombocytopenia. So you don't produce as many platelets. Platelets are decreased production, increased destruction, um, increased spleen sequestration. So there's just less functional platelets in the body. So you set them up for bleeding. So prof can be profoundly thrombocytopenic. They also um, are coagulopathic. So they don't produce the vitamin K, a lot of the proteins that are required for um, coagulation, like the glue that adds to the platelets to help them bind. Um, so that can set them up for high INR, that can set them up for bleeding. Um, these people are bleeders. They bleed all the time, everywhere. So, and here you are in ICU and you're fixing to poke every hole they got. So it's fun. It's super fun. Um, when it comes to bleeding with these people, I like to use tags. Uh, not uh, all organizations have access to a tag. Tag is a thromboelastogram. I love, 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 love tags. I love anything that will help, whether it's a calculation or um, like a, a risk score or a test, this algorithmic where you just like plug things and you're like this, 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 and then it spits out an answer for you. Makes me very happy. Tags are like that. So a thromboelastogram um, is looking at this, it's looking at clot formation, how fast it forms, like how quickly it starts forming, how um, quickly it um, progresses, the angle progresses to the, let me think how to word this, how quickly the, the angle of rise of, um, um, I always think of like steepling, like um, creating the, um, the, the factors within a clot that make it strong. So how quickly it starts forming, how quickly it starts becoming strong, and then, um, and then eventually how long it takes for it to degrade. So tags look like a wine glass. When you look at the picture of them, um, you look at four or five different factors within this clot formation and what's deranged, what's long, what's short, are they coagulopathic, um, you know, really set up for bleeding and why? Is it because of the lack of FFP? Is it because of lack of platelets? Is it because of, um, you know, any of these kind of factors or are they hypercoagulable? Are they clotting really, really fast? And do they need um, TPA or something like that? So very, very fascinating. Traditionally used by trauma teams, surgical teams, people who are needing a lot of factor repletion, but I love it because it tells you exactly what to replace, right? Because currently we don't want to just snow people with a ton of packed red blood cells. That's not good. People need whole blood. People need all the products, not only to replace, you know, to treat anemia, but to replace the factors that are missing in forming clots so they will stop bleeding. So it's like hitting all these different little pathways. So I love tags. So I use tags a lot in these people. Um, I will only treat the thrombocytopenia if they're bleeding. If it's very, very low, like under 50 plus, they have something pending that we need to do to them. Um, being judicial in it because volume, right? Volume is a problem with these people. So the more you pour on them, the kind of worse it gets. Very, 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 very challenging. Very careful balance to ride. Um, <clears throat> um, Coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, jaundice, jaundice. So they're going to be highlighter yellow. Why do I talk about this? Because there's not much you can do about it. More just because know how high your bilirubin is. The higher the bilirubin, the worse their mortality is, the worse they are. You can also give um, cholesterol, 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 cholesterol that will help bind it a little bit and that will help treat itching. So if you have an awake patient, which we rarely do, but if you do, you can give them that to help with the itching associated with it. Outside of that, ain't much you can do. Um, oh, you can also make sure the bile ducts are patent. So these are people where if they have a gallbladder, you wanna make sure that all the bile ducts are not, you don't have um, uh, cholangitis or something else leading to worsening of the like nothing gallbladder related that's worsening the bilirubin. That's all I'm saying. It's just liver. Um, so rule that kind of stuff out. And hypoglycemia, which is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is the last thing. Once they can no longer regulate their sugars, 
your days are numbered. So if you are getting calls from the nurses or you are having to push D50 a lot or start them on a dextrose infusion, it's late. It's late in the game, friends. Um, it's probably the last thing to go. So again, it just helps to put it into context because again, I think that sometimes people don't realize, you know, all these many, many different factors are actually because the liver's worse. So it helps you to make things concise for everybody caring for the patient. It helps you to make things concise in your mind so you know how bad things are so you can have appropriate discussions with your family. Go to care everything with these patients. Um, I think that's all I have on liver. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. It's a complicated topic. I mean, super, super complicated. So um, I need to finish my makeup. I can either leave this on and y'all can watch me and we can just stare at each other or let me think what I can monologue on next. I need to get the next color. Oh, dang, I already closed it. What's going to do? Pink. Pinks. Feeling the browns and pinks tonight. I picked up an extra night shift this week. So tonight's not even my last night. I got another one after this. But you know, money. <laughs> money talks. Do you guys work at a place where you get paid overtime? Because I don't. Sure don't. <laughs> I get paid my standard pay. Um, I'll do. Hmm, I'll do this light, light one. It's called dust. Yeah, dust. Nope, salary. Yeah, I'm salaried too. But like most people, well, not most. Most places where I've worked other jobs, right? I've taken PRN jobs at other hospitals and I know a lot of people in the area and um, most places were all for just like they do for nurses, like critical pay or incentive pay when, when it's short staffed, but uh, not my hospital. They say that we're already highly paid at the rate that we're at. And so they use that as a justification. And not so bedside nurses are in a lot of cases making more than I am right now. I heard some nurses in the hallway last night. I don't know who this is. If y'all are bedside, uh, give me, drop me a little line. Let me know how things are in the market for bedside right now. Like, is it still super good if you're a traveler? Because um, I heard some night shift travelers last night um, laughing and joking. And they said that they were talking about going to their next assignment that was paying $180 an hour. Okay, we're in Georgia, y'all. I don't even think in the height of COVID they were paying that much. I mean, maybe 150 for like hard to staff units, but $180 an hour. A lot of my friends are like, I'm going back to bed. So I'm like, I don't think I could do it. I, I don't know. NPs, Chad, can you do it mm -mm. for the, for a ton of money? I don't think I could, even for a ton of money, I don't think I can do it. I'm just too frustrated. I'm too frustrated by people. <laughs> I need, I need to maintain the kind of relationship I have with patients right now. I, I don't, I don't think I could do it. Plus, you know, I see it's very physical. I've got an old back. I don't think physically, physicality was a, a little bit of a factor on why I left the bedside. So I don't, I don't think I could do it. Um, but my gosh, are we short nurses? Our place is doing this team approach to nursing. This is their way of tackling the nursing shortage. They, they group them, which I commend them for, you know, trying to think outside the box and come up. It's just a hard spot to be in. I mean, I'm not bashing our administrators at all because I can't imagine having to make the decisions they make, but um, this team nursing crap, <laughs> it's for the birds, you know, some of these really hard to staff units, some of these um, like med surge units, um, they'll have like a nurse, like an RN, an LPN, and a tech for an astronomical amount of patients, you know, six, seven, eight. And they'll just share the workload, which I think in some ways is good because it helps them like work as a unified group and, and kind of be more accountable to helping each other. But um, my thing with this is it's people don't have a like there's no one person that has a great deep understanding about what's going on with anybody. So like if I go to a rapid response, which I do in my hospital, trying to figure out what happened to the patient, there may be, you know, three or four people in the room trying to tell me the story and there's no one unit. I mean, eventually we'll get to the root of it. Uh, usually. Wow. It's pitch black outside and wow. It's a, 
it may actually be a tornado, friends. Sure sounds like it. Um, okay, I'm just about done here so y'all can move on with your lives. 105. This is the longest live I've ever done. Are y'all y'all over it? Um, when we started doing rapid response calls at my hospital, I was not real sure about it. I was not real sure that this is the role I wanted to play as an NP. I'm an ICU NP. And, um, but I kind of love it, actually. It gives me a little bit of my, like, I was an ER nurse for six years. So it kind of gives me some of that uh, feel back. It's those vibes. Those vibes are back. Because it's like you walk into a room, you don't know what's happening. You're trying to figure it out. Um, sometimes it's like nothing, like stupid stuff. And sometimes you go and you're like, oh, well, oh no, this is not a rapid. This is a code blue. <laughs> well, let's just let's just hit that button and change the change the plan here. <laughs> um, so it's always fun. You never know what you're gonna get. It's kind of fun. And at night, it's even more so because, like, here's the thing about night, y'all. I recently started doing nights. If y'all don't know, I have been a day shifter my entire 23 career, 23 year career. And um, I started doing nights because we have a big shortage of night people and I agreed to do it. it. It sort of fit with some of the goals that I have currently. So I was like, all right, I'll try it. And I, found, I figured out a way to make it work for me physically. Um, I mean, it always kind of sucks, but you take the good with the bad, right? Um, so I've been doing it for a little while. But um, so there are a lot of things that happen on night shift that I, I didn't know about. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know friends, but like one of them is you go to the rapid response call and it's like nine times out of 10, it's altered mental status. And the patient is like sleepy. And I'm like, well, are they sleepy? Cause it's like nighttime and they're supposed to be sleepy <laughs> or are they sleepy because something's wrong? I don't know. This is not something we really got to deal with during the day. So like, oh, this is a little different. Never stop learning. I learn something new every single day I go to work every single day. Okay. I think I'm about to wrap this up. Y'all I'm pretty much done. I'll take down the hair for the big reveal that y'all are gonna be like, wow, she looks like a different human being <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. Um, there are still three people on here. I know y'all are. Thanks for sticking out or joining. If you're just joining us, we're about to end. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Oh, Oh, nuts. We are live here. You can come on in. <laughs> um, okay. I hope y'all, if you're around this area, survive the tornado. Get your plants watered. And I will see y'all next week. Let me know. Leave me a topic if you want to hear about. Because I have not yet planned out what my blog post is going to be next week. It's not going to be complicated like liver failure. Next week, actually, next week is going to be something <clears throat> professional NP related. So... I'm actually thinking I might do um, board testing, like how to prepare for boards. I think that's probably what I'll do because a lot of you, because a lot of people right now just graduated school and are wanting to know how to study for boards. So that's my plan. DIC. Ooh. There's just no fix for DIC. All right. I'll put it on. That'll be the next educational topic. Not next week, but the week after DIC. Yeah, it's not a bad one because we can talk about tags. Love to talk about tags. Um, all right, y'all have a great shift if y'all are going into work. If not, survive the um, thanks for your laid back and relaxed, informative talk. Oh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Never stop learning, friends, even from random people on the internet. <laughs> all right, y'all, see you later. Thanks for coming. <laughs>